90 estates uh, over the last 10 years have either been partly uh, or fully demolished. Uh, the Conservatives, uh, in addition to that, are uh, <coughs> proposing an estate regeneration program uh, of uh, an additional uh, 100 uh, estates uh, uh, to go through that uh, similar process. Uh, at the same time, there's the raft of benefit cuts, bedroom tax, housing and planning bill, uh, and then we've got the other side of the coin that we spent a lot of this morning uh, talking about, uh, which is the influx of global capital into the housing market and how that's financializing the entire uh, housing market. And we're seeing more than 300 towers of luxury apartments go up all, all over London. The figure was 200 just a few months ago. You know, there's a huge feature in the Observer. More than 230 towers. Well, now it's more than 330 towers. It seems to be going up uh, ex exponentially. Uh, and uh, as we discussed this morning, a lot of this is aimed at foreign uh, investors. Uh, and London now has the second highest high house prices in the world uh, outside of Monaco. Uh, and of course, this is very much focused here on London, but it's not just about London, it's about the UK as a whole uh, and the impact of, on the south of England and on towns and cities, particularly uh, in, in the southeast, uh, from Bristol to Margate uh, to Hastings. Sorry, not, they're not all in the southeast, but they're in the south. Um, so, I, I mean, I, just to go back to that, I'm calling that the re imaging of the whole of London. Uh, and I will talk a little bit more about that uh, later. I just want to go back to uh, estate regeneration, for which re demolition, because I do think that is largely, I'm saying largely, not always, I do think that is largely what it is. This is Robin Hood Gardens, uh, which failed in its uh, status to gain listing. My students will know it well because we've been around it a few times. Uh, I think it's an incredible place, and if it had the sort of investment that uh, the Barbican has uh, had, there's no doubt that uh, homes in it would be going for uh, you know millions. Actually, I would have thought, but it's due to be demolished any minute. Uh, I understand. Actually, when I went round it, we bumped into several tour groups of. Uh, foreign architectural sort of students. People say, oh, we're from Argentina. We've come to see Robin Hood Gardens. But, oh, well, we're studying it because it's about to be demolished. You know, they, they couldn't believe it. Uh, this uh, image here is Cressingham Gardens. We've got people from Cressingham Gardens here. They contributed to the special uh, feature. One of Lambeth's estates uh, also uh, now slated for demolition, described I think by a past president of Reba as one of the nicest small schemes uh, in England. No way really that this place can fit into David Cameron's uh, narrative of uh, sink estates which blight the lives of residents, which we shall come in on to in a minute. Uh, this is the, sorry, these images are a bit blurry. They haven't taken very well to being in, increased in size. This is the Haggerston Estate in Hackney, which I understand actually efforts here were made to involve tenants a lot more in uh, that process uh, of regeneration and is perhaps a different uh, approach uh, to take. And it's perhaps Guy Nicholson from Hackney will tell us something about that. Uh, when he speaks, it's not always uh, the same process, but I'm afraid I do think it is largely the same process. So really, you know, I'm very much emphasizing what I see as the death, really, of social housing. This is a large part of what we're discussing uh, today. Uh, you know, and the list is endless. Carpenters Estate, Robin Hood Gardens, Haygate, Aylesbury, West Hendon, Woodbury Down, Pressingham Gardens, etc., etc. You know, I, I could go on. So why, you know, it is obviously more than a bit ironic that at a time of such acute housing crisis, we are demolishing the very homes which people on low incomes can actually afford to live in. Now, in answer to the question why, you've got what I would call the sink estate narrative, which has been put forward by David Cameron recently, 
uh, in his piece in the Sunday Times a few months ago, where he announced his estate regeneration program, and he said that these uh, were sink estates which blight the lives of residents, uh, and by uh, demolishing them and replacing them with mixed communities, uh, life chances for residents would be improved and everything would be great for all. Of course, I'm a little more cynical, as are you, about that. Uh, and actually, I would uh, say very much, as a lot of the academics in the room uh, also have said, that this is about what's called state-led gentrification and the rent gap. We've heard that term already this morning. Uh, and I think one of the clearest statements uh, of what's uh, really going on uh, can be found in a recent report commissioned by uh, the uh, Labour, former Labour uh, cabinet minister, Andrew Adonis, who has now been appointed by George Osborne to chair the National Infrastructure Commission. So this former Labour minister is, I think, arguably the most important person in planning in Britain. And he has powers not just over housing and planning, but also other very contentious issues such as fracking, which face uh, similar uh, abuses in uh, democracy. Uh, but uh, Adonis uh, collaborated with Savills, the estate agents, to produce a report published, I believe, by the IPPR called City of Villages. Uh, and that, I think, has really promoted uh, this agenda and the Tories' 100 Estates uh, Regeneration Plan. And when he was uh, promoting the report, Adonis gave an interview to the FT, which I think makes it really clear what this is all about. This, and this is what he said. The scale of council-owned land is vast and greatly underappreciated. There are particularly large concentrations of council-owned land in inner London, and this is some of the highest prices, priced land in the world. The local authority planning regime has got to adapt properly to the potential for market priced rent developments. So this actually is what it's all about. So the picture on, one, on the one hand of all the estates coming down, and on the other hand of all the uh, hundreds of towers of luxury apartments going up is uh, entirely intertwined. And it's all about uh, the price of land uh, and uh, the uh, speculation uh, on that land. Uh, so that's uh, combined with the Tories' housing agenda the benefit cuts and the council cuts, and also the housing and planning bill, which I want to highlight particularly. I just heard just now, I didn't even know this, and I'm supposed to be sort of fairly abreast of these changes, but there's a blizzard of so much going on that it's impossible to keep up with. But I just heard in my workshop that all Section 106 agreements are to be for affordable housing are to be abolished under the housing and planning bill and replaced by requirements for starter homes. Um, anyway, uh, I'm going to say in a, in a later slide about uh, an ass the assault to democracy that the housing and planning bill, but I can't resist saying it now, the housing and planning bill was debated at two o'clock in the morning in the House of Commons. I mean, how can that be that such a hugely controversial and important piece of legislation was debated in the middle of the night. You know, what kind of uh, democracy uh, are we living in? Uh, and then I want to raise the point which was raised uh, this morning, uh, and I'm sure will be raised again, that this is not a Conservative versus Labour issue, because it is Labour councils who are also very, very much uh, at the forefront of this agenda. Lambeth is demolishing uh, Cressingham Gardens uh, and uh, a number of uh, other uh, estates, and uh, Southwark uh, is responsible for the demolition uh, of the Haygate and uh, many others. And they are very much as ideologically at the forefront of this as uh, any uh, Tory council. So, you know, as I said, uh, with regard to the Housing and Planning Bill, this is a complete democratic failure. It completely disregards uh, the wishes of local communities, uh, you know, representatives of which we have many uh, in the room today, uh, sh totally sham consultations, 
you know, failure of the councillors to, to respond to, to what uh, residents uh, want. I did a piece of work for uh, the lobbying transparency uh, group Spinwatch a couple of years ago, which looked at the revolving door between councils, uh, lobbyists uh, and developers, and how people who were working in regeneration at Southwark Council went directly on to work for Lendlease, uh, the developer who's in charge of a lot of that uh, uh, Elephant, and, Elephant Park uh, development uh, in Elephant and Castle. And I found some really shocking things, actually, about the sort of tactics uh, that are used uh, to scare residents, basically, uh, to misinform them, to distort the information that they receive, uh, to, to, to fail to tell them when key meetings uh, are heard. Uh, actually, we, we had a testimony from a PR who said that the strategy uh, was to scare the living daylights out of people uh, to ship them up. Now, that actually referred to... Uh, the uh, HS2 bill. It wasn't directly referring to council estate demolition, but it's the same PR company that acts for developers, and I see very much the same narratives uh, as play, at play, which perhaps some of you do uh, as well. So there's a real democratic failure going on here, both in central uh, and local government. Uh, uh, and then, of course, we've got the Orwellian uh, definition of affordable housing, and there's been some discussions of, of, as to what is genuine affordable housing. Well, one thing's for sure, genuine affordable housing is not up to 80% of market rent, uh, which is what George Osborne has redefined uh, affordable housing uh, to, to, to mean. So when uh, you know, these Section 106 agreements have been ripped up, and we have affordable housing requirements for up to 80% of market rent. This is basically entirely reconfiguring London. So it's not just the demolition of estates, it's the creation of all these uh, new places, the, the huge privatised enclaves which stretch down from uh, Wandsworth through to Battersea Power Station, uh, Southwark, uh, Blackfriars, uh, the Nine Elms uh, uh, development around the US Embassy. This, this is, these are enormous pieces of a new kind uh, uh, of London. Uh, and um, it's also very much a sort of a new sort of city that we're living in. And I see the Garden Bridge actually is quite symbolic of this. It's a privatised bridge, it's not a public right of way, it will be closed overnight, there's all sorts of things you're not allowed to do uh, there. And also it's not just, you know, housing that we're talking about, this is a hugely expensive city. You know, I've got young children, you can't have a day out with your kids for less than £100. You know, we can't afford, I think Aditya this morning was talking about defining down. The city has been defined down so that People just really can't afford to be uh, in it. Okay, so I've nearly finished uh, now. I'm just going to finish with a couple of final images uh, relating to Elephant and Castle because this is just such a sort of stark example of what's happening. So you saw the Haygate earlier, and this is Elephant Park, which is now going up uh, uh, on the hole in the ground, which was the Haygate. And prices on the Haygate range from £750,000 to a million pounds for a two-bed flat. And actually, 80% of that is affordable housing. <laughs> so this graph has been discussed in a few places and is from the anti-gentrification report that Loretta mentioned. What happens to the people? Well, this is what has happened to the tenants, uh, many of whom, they've all been... Uh, displaced, many of whom have been uh, displaced from uh, the borough, causing pressure on other boroughs. Some of them will have been exported entirely out of London, which may come out later. I think our estimates 50,000 people were actually exported from the capital uh, last year. So the tenants have done really terribly uh, with the sort of disruption to communities, homes, families, taking the kids out of school and all that entails. But who has really, really suffered 
are those uh, icons of Margaret Thatcher's property-owning democracy, the people who bought their homes under the right to buy. Because, of course, they're offered such paltry compensation for their properties in this massively uh, inflated market that they can't afford to, to buy anything, uh, and they can't afford to live in London, and they live in places like uh, Thurrock, uh, and Rochester, and Sidcup, uh, and Orpington. And, you know, just absolutely terrible stories. I think one of the workshops dealt with the link between mental health uh, and displacement. And I know Lorette has done uh, quite a lot of work uh, on that uh, as well. So these are, at root, this is people's lives that, that we're talking about. Okay, so what's going to happen? Well, you know, I've sketched the picture of, on the one hand, the estates come down. On the other hand, the luxury towers uh, go up. Um, you know, arguably, this is, this, is, this is the spiral we're in, you know, and this is sort of oligarchy and oligopoly, and it's just sort of going to get worse and worse. Or actually, have we reached a tipping point? You know, are these meetings becoming a little bit more coherent? Are people starting to really understand that there's sort of alternative ways of doing things, looking towards what is happening in uh, other parts of Europe, Stuart referred to uh, this morning? Uh, actually, also, you know, this market, this crazy market, <coughs> clearly has reached uh, its peak, and it's now being reported that there's quite a slowdown in the sales of these uh, uh, stupidly built towers that no one wants to live in or can afford to, to live in. Uh, and there's this huge upsurge in opposition. So, you know, I feel there's all to play for, and, you know, I hope we can be part of a, a continuing discussion. And while a conference in itself, a one-day conference, isn't going to solve all these problems, we've got the publication that we, we've all contributed here, all of us in this room, and you know, hopefully we can use that as a, as a reference point going forward um, as well. So, thanks. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And um, uh, I'd just like to thank Anna for the invitation to come along um, and just perhaps with yourself share some thoughts and experiences about what's happening in Hackney. I can't stand here and speak for the whole of the local government family. Uh, in London, and as Anna has eloquently described, and as I know many of you are already aware of, there are different things happening in different communities around the capital when it comes to quite literally building new neighbourhoods for communities to live, grow up in, and work in as well. But I can talk about it from the Hackney perspective, and I can also talk about the challenges that Hackney is facing at the moment and how we as a political administration are responding to those challenges. I can also contextualize it with the other aspect of uh, Anna's presentation and that you've been discussing over the course of the day, and that's what's coming down the tracks through national government's legislation. It is not a good time for local government. There is no question about that. The current national government is imposing a structural change without actually giving any form of leadership or vision as to what local government of tomorrow will look like. The local government that is supposed to serve communities is being continually undermined and it is also being under-resourced to a degree that is quite eye-watering. So already, £60 million has been taken out of a revenue grant to the London Borough of Hackney, and that is set to continue and escalate still further through to 2020. And there is no indication that, at national level, that anything will change to that spending plan to those cuts. And they are cuts. When you overlay that, everything that sits, for example, within a housing and planning bill, then one can begin to perhaps start to appreciate this is profoundly affecting not just local government as an institution, but the very communities that that local government is meant to be serving, supporting, enabling, and caring for. And this is outrageous. It is an absolutely outrageous direction of travel that has been established. And I'm sure you, it is of no surprise to yourselves that fundamentally my response to that is that we're being led 
progressively into a market-led world. The kind of world which if you fall over on a street corner, there won't be anybody there to pick you up and dust you down, get you back on your feet and on your way again. There might be on one or two corners, but it will depend whether or not you can pay the proverbial 50p for someone to come along and pick you up. And we're progressively moving to that point. If you flip that into what we're here to discuss, the homes, the homes of tomorrow, we're experiencing it already. So this morning, on the Today programme, apart from listening to Sadiq talking, it was his turn, um, on the programme this morning, there were young people saying, we can't get a home. We can't find a home. Some were talking about renting a home, some were talking about buying a home, and these weren't extravagant demands being made by 26, 27, 28 year olds. These were real, real needs. They were about more space, they were about growing families, they were about being able to live not that far away from work. Because the other factor around commuting and the cost of commuting that has escalated to such a degree is that if we follow some of those stories that Anna's map was showing around people moving some 30 miles outside the capital, but still working in the capital. Mate, you must think we're daft. Yeah. You're not building homes for the people who are trying to get them. You're evicting them to get the land they built on. If you just but listen to me, I'll come to that. I will come to that. The election model in Hackney is being managed by several estate agents. Yeah, thank you. I will tell you how the estate is influencing your decisions in Hackney. We don't want an austerity argument. Stop blaming the Tories on the Housing and Planning Bill on your aggressively pursued estate regeneration. If you would just listen to me. If you would just listen to me. It is important that I contextualise for you what is actually going on. And I'm now about to tell you what the response is to what the you know, position and the situation that the local authority in that is being put into and the, and the community are being forced into. The response that we have taken is that people must have decent homes. Residents must have decent homes and everybody has a right of return to those homes. No, you listen to me. You can talk afterwards. Please be quiet, Simon. Please be quiet, Simon. Shut up, Simon. Okay. Thank you very much. Let me appreciate what you're saying, Simon. No, 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 just listen to what we've got, let's listen to what we've got to say. Okay, look, we've got other speakers who would also like to speak, so please can we take it in turns and act like grown-ups, please? I'll be saying something. What did you say? Oh, no. You know, thank you, grown-up. I don't like seeing someone lie. You know, in a conference that's meant to be about housing crisis. Yes, I suppose we can talk about this in the question and answer in a minute. So just let me talk first, you guys have been here all night. Thank you, Director. <clears throat> so, Hackney Council's response and the way in which, as a political administration, we have taken forward and challenged what it is that central government are imposing upon local government is that we are using our land to build new homes for the future, to build decent homes for those who already have them, and to guarantee a right of return for those individuals. And we are doing that despite a government and their policies. And that is the approach that we have consistently taken over the last 10 years. But this situation is now in real jeopardy because of the changes to legislation and, yes, the changes to revenue. It is in real threat of unravelling. Because if this housing and planning bill comes through, then we won't be able to do that. Hackney Council, at the moment, is racing ahead, trying to ensure that there is a coherent planning strategy for every single asset that it owns. Because it knows that if this bill gets approved, <coughs> almost overnight, central government can intervene and force development upon that land. 
people. We believe that when new homes are being built in our borough, in our community, in our neighbourhoods, that there is always a, an affordable housing contribution that comes forward, that there is always a right of return if we are rebuilding a council estate. We also have housing associations, like in all other boroughs, where we have a real problem with. The problem being, again, and the reality is, legislation coming down the traps is saying that people can start buying their housing association homes. They are being aggressively pushed towards the market. This is not good. When we then compound it with the reality, we have a growing community. And I'm sure Sean will talk about London as a city and the growth that's happening, the way in which the populations are expanding. When I first became a Hackney, a Hackney councillor, there were in the region of 170,000 people living and growing up in the London Borough of Hackney. That number has gone up and now it's around 270,000 and it's climbing. By 2020, we anticipate it will be 300,000 people living in the London Borough of Hackney. And we have to make sure that there are decent homes for people and we have to make sure that we can do that despite the central government and its ambitions for our futures. Now, Anna finished off by saying something really, really quite important. If we could just perhaps become more coherent about our thinking, have a greater sense of consensus, not fly off the handle about using others and other pressures as an excuse for not doing something, but recognise that actually where we're all heading is in the same direction. Because what we're talking about in Hackney is about homes for everyone, homes for the future, homes for those of us living on our own, those of us who have families, homes for older people and younger people. And we are going down that route and we will remain focused on that. But we were going to need as much support as possible to be able to ensure that when a housing and planning bill hits the front line, that it has either been changed to such a degree that we can work with this crappy legislation. We are implementing. We have been and are implementing an ideological solution to what the current government wish to impose. And our ambition is to continue doing that. But rather than slagging us off, perhaps you could come along and support us. Chair, yeah, thank you very much indeed. Okay, well, hi, um, and thanks for, thanks for having me today. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm doing a lot, of, I'm standing for Mayor of London at the moment, and I'm doing an awful lot of hustings where we have like 30 seconds to tell like everyone about all our housing policies. and. Um, it's, it's, it's impossible because it's really, really complicated. So hopefully, um, I'm, I'm going to try not to give a political speech or tell you why you should vote for me. Um, if I stray into that, let me off. Um, but uh, I mean, I, I'm thinking because I'm because I'm I'm from the Green Party, and because we're not, I'm not, you know, the Tory party who's doing the housing bill, or from the Labour councils who are doing a lot of these um, projects. I think I can take a, a political view from outside that's, that's maybe um, somewhere in between, well, not, not somewhere between those two, my goodness, no, um, but somewhere, <laughs> somewhere outside, a more, you know, a, a political view that's slightly longer, and I'd, I'd really welcome the chance to talk about this in slightly less sort of hustings -y terms as well. So, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about this, the question we're, we're asked to address in this session is, you know, is London being socially cleansed? Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people out there and, um, there's a lot of really good arguments that, that suggest that is the end result. Um, and the question I think is, you know, is this, is this being done intentionally? Is, there, is, this, is this an end result that's, that's part of the ideology or is this an accident? And I think, you know, you, you heard then from, the, from Labour 
that they think, you know, the unbelievable pressures they're under that leaves them with no choice to do it. And you've got the housing and planning bill, which you're all, um, you all talked about earlier on, um, with so many different provisions. And if you look at the disparate provisions that they've got in there, the sell-off of high-value homes, the, the right to buy, the housing associations, all of it looks like a, a rather, you know, bits and pieces, but definitely when you put the picture together, it looks like an ideological assault on what's left of council homes, and that seems really problematic. Then you've got councils, and I'm a councillor in Camden, and I know that we have enormous cuts in our government grants. And so you've got councils there who are who are suffering from well reductions in the housing grants that you can get for, for projects anyway, um, but also reductions in their own revenue, um, and th and they do have a, a problem with with how to do things like better homes and how to how to create more more homes and and things like that. But then. I look at things like um, the evidence of what's happened so far in the state. So the housing, um, this is a really good report um, from the Housing Committee on the London Assembly, um, which looked at 50 estates that have been regenerated across London um, and what had happened. There were 30,000 homes on these estates um, and they, they built, they re regenerated, they demolished a lot of them and rebuilt them and they ended up with more homes in total. The vast majority of the new homes were market rent, and in the process there was a net loss of 8,000 council homes. So you, you're losing council homes there as a result of the project. So, so why are you doing these projects at all? If you've got a really bad situation um, in terms of what you can do, what you've got money you can get from the government, why, why would you be doing things that lead to the net loss of council um, homes? And So I think the motivations are partly um, from what I can see looking around London, talking to people and meeting councillors, they quite like being housing developers. They're quite sort of drawn into this close relationship between them and the developers. Um, they're getting a lot of advice from people who are very much in the market um, and who want to see as many um, high value homes as possible built. Um, they also have a motivation in terms of, of council tax and this is why I worry about the social cleansing side of things because that you talk to people again. I've been around to a lot of, lot of meetings and things, and, and it does seem to me that people do believe that low value people are being forced out of London in favour of people who pay higher rates of council tax to help with the, the problems that the council have. And that's, that's a bit of a, an issue for me. Um, obviously, they're getting into deals with private companies now, they're setting up their own private companies, partly as a result, and they'll say this about of the housing bill, and the fact that the private companies might not be subjected to um, right to buy. Um, but obviously their partners, their private companies that they get involved with, they're probably making a profit as well. So it, it really worries me. I do think there, there's evidence that there is an ideological social cleansing of London. I think it's driven by the Conservatives. I think a lot of Labour councils are getting into trouble um, in the process of, of trying to implement it. And I think a lot of Labour councils, I mean, talking to the Cressingham Gardens people who are here somewhere, um, yes, the, the, a lot of Labour councils are, are really, really poor at consultation. It just seems to be in their blood that they, they like to go to people and say, look, you can have this terrible option or nothing, and, yeah. and that's it, and we've consulted you, and that's, that's been done now. Um, so, so, yes, I think the conclusion I can draw is that, that we, are, we, are, we can appreciate some of the motivations here. Some of them are very ideological. Some of them are just mistakes, repeating the mistakes of the past, like PFI and getting, getting too sucked into being involved with, with big private companies. Um, but the end result of all this is, is social cleansing. You know, what, are we, what are we gonna do um, with, how are, we gonna, how are we gonna run our city when we can't house our lower paid workers, when we can't house people who need to do all the, the normal jobs, the normal jobs where you would normally be able to live somewhere. Um, there is one final thing, I would say, um, and it's, I am a private renter. I rent my own flat and I, and I struggle, and I know a lot of people who, live, you know, the, 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 the barely affordable thing they can do when they are short of money and they need to, you know, they need to stay in London is rent former council homes from leaseholders. And there's a lot of people who do that. It's, it's, a, it's the barely affordable homes that, you, that, that just about help a lot of people get by. Um, and when we have council estate regenerations, those people are the first to go, they have no say whatsoever. Um, and, you know, even, even Anna's slide there didn't show what happened to the people. 
um, on Haygate who were privately renting from leaseholders. So we mustn't forget about them because they are an awful lot of people in, uh, in London and, uh, and they don't seem to have any say whatsoever. Um, and I think, I think that's kind of it really. I wanted to talk about some better ways of doing it, um, which is kind of my, this is the hustling pitch that I give when, I, when I'm asked to talk about my, my plans. Um, you know, we have to raise some more money to pay for better council, like more council homes. We have to change the, um, the economics of each of these, these regenerations as they go on. And I think the regenerations have to be led by the people. Um, I think, you know, a lot of councils will talk about how they're, they're trying to do this. I know this was tried on the Andover estate in Islington, um, but then the council turned around at the last minute and said, no, we can't, we can't do it. You've made a lovely plan, but we, we can't afford that anymore. It's not viable, we'll have to do something else. Um, we, we do need to be properly doing this from the ground up, and I think we will get better schemes that way. Um, I want to make sure there's a team in City Hall to give support to people, because every time I go to an estate that's, in, that's having trouble, there's somebody whose living room is this high in paper who is doing all the work of checking and the expertise and, and trying to just keep an eye on all the council documents that come out. And um, that's, that's great when there's somebody who can do it, but when there isn't, um, people really are a bit stuffed and I think we do need to be empowering people who don't already have those skills to be able to, to challenge things and giving them free expertise. Um, we do need to be looking at different ways of regenerating. I'll say a green thing now, which is that knocking down perfectly good buildings um, and rebuilding them um, and rebuilding, bringing in all new concrete is really, really bad use of resources. It's, it's the embodied carbon of the buildings. <laughs> even get included in the assessments um, and that's appalling um, and it needs to be included and if you do this, the sums in a different way you find that infill and adding things on top um, makes a lot more sense. Darren Johnson, um, who I'm hoping to replace on the London Assemblies, does some great work on this looking at the potential for adding new floors to council estates um, and, and just increasing the housing that way um, without displacing anyone in the process. And that's the final thing is we have to be looking at the social cost of this. We really do have to do a proper cost benefit analysis that includes the social cost because even a successful regeneration, if, that, if everything was replaced with new council homes, you'd still have 10 years of blight there and you've got to take that into account um, because not everybody comes back even if you allow for the perfect right to return people get displaced and they stay away you're still breaking up communities and and that really upsets me so there you go that's that's my little i'm very unprepared talk <laughs> because i'm running around all over the place but i think i think i am i'm gaining a, a really clear perspective on this and it's like the opposite of lord adonis there. I don't see not regenerating council estates. I don't see not knocking things down and building luxury flats as an opportunity cost. I think breaking up communities, socially cleansing London is the cost we must avoid at all costs if we possibly can. And I'm prepared to look at lots of different ways of doing it. I got involved with the campaign because I'm a Stratford resident, uh, so kind of through proximity, I got helped out the store a couple of times and then uh, supported the occupation of the carpenters estate. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of uh, background context to some of the regeneration that's happened specifically in Newham. Well, I've probably gone, probably talked a bit about this earlier in the day, so apologies for any repetition. Uh, we're winding back to sort of 2005 and when London won the Olympic bid and obviously in order to win the bid there were lots of promises made about the benefit to local communities and the kind of uh, positive things these things bring as, um, as Anna was talking about earlier like the Commonwealth Games and FIFA and you know the World Cup global sporting events rarely, rarely do that in fact they often do the opposite um, and the Carpenters Estate is a really, really good example because they were promised uh, an entrance specifically onto the, onto the Olympic Park from the estate. Um, that has never been built, that was never materialised. And I think you've got a really good, um, quite clear aesthetic um, sort of idea, sort of image where you go through the, I don't know if anyone's been to the Olympic Park, it's quite leafy and lush and there's 
well designed and whatever. And then right next to it, you've got this empty council estate with nobody living in it because the council doesn't want anyone in it. Um, the council, the estate itself was begunned because uh, UCL put in a bid to build a campus there, which was then successfully resisted by the local residents, but not before the council moved lots of people out and never put them back in again. So if you go into some of the tower blocks, um, like is it Denison Point, and the they are just ghost towers. Like you go in, there are entire floors that are just shut off that the, uh, the media Al Jazeera, the BBC occupied during the Olympics and can't get in them and they just haven't filled them up again. Um, that was that bit. And, <laughs> but also, so it's also, and also that was the thing I want to say was that it's important to think of these in a sort of slightly global context as well because obviously it's not just happening in London, it's happening in you know, Spain and Greece and wherever, all over the world. Lots of things happening in Rio at the moment with, with the Olympics happening in Brazil. And actually displacement and social cleansing is a very, very common aspect of having a large international sporting event in your local vicinity. And actually what happens is all the rules and all the laws change temporarily. They come in and build a small totalitarian state and kick everyone out and then they leave. And it's, it's never, you know, they would, we were talk, it, they said it's the first Olympic Games to put legacy in the heart of the bids. And actually, if you go into the Carpenters' estate, you can clearly see that just isn't the case at all. Um, and also, it's, it's, I think it's important to think in terms of building solidarity across, bringing it back a bit to the sort of the UK and building solidarity across with other towns in the UK. I'm actually from Bristol. I grew up in Bristol. It's a school that I love it. Um, <laughs> There's always one. And, um, and um, uh, although I've been in London for sort of just shy ten years now, I still, you know, very much call myself a custodian. And actually, it's it, it, the displacement is is having a massive impact on towns and cities around London, you know, and in the south of the, of the country. And just to share a little tidbit from a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, who still lives in Bristol. The moment he was a friend of his was. I think selling their house and uh, they were giving viewings to people and I think this particular couple that were looking at the house couldn't quite meet the asking price and as they were having the viewing somebody came in, somebody from London who I think had sold their house in London had come and knocked on the door said I'll give you £10,000 over the asking price in cash and, and obviously you know so this is for Bristolians, and then lots of people coming in is, you know, is causing lots and lots of problems. And obviously, the high-speed rail line that's going to be built is going to increase house prices. And I think it's important to remember that, although London is it, the, the problem is particularly acute here um, because the wealth divide is as great as it is, it is happening in other parts of the country as well. Um, I'm going to hand over. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about some statistics in Newham, um, and I think it's really important uh, when we hear about Labour councils being put into tricky situations and they have no way out. They've actually, it's just, I mean, so, so at the moment, uh, well, uh, <laughs> Newham Council is in about a billion, a billion, half a billion pounds worth of debt, and this is due to controversial uh, lender option and borrow option, borrow option loans or Lobo loans as they're known. Um, and in 2013, Newham had the highest level of Lobo loan debt of any local authority in the UK. Um, and these are loans they don't have to take out in the way that they have done. This is something they've specifically chosen to do. They're more expensive than borrowing from the government. Um, and these loans have been missold um, and advice that they've been given, uh, uh, sorry, has, they've been given conflicted advice and kind of, um, and one of the statistics that's really uh, interesting to show kind of how bad uh, these loans have been affected in London, the average amount of council tax that goes back to paying loans is about 23%. In Newham, it's 80% of council tax goes back to paying these loans. Um, and how does this affect the local people? Well, local housing allowance uh, comes about, is about £788, pounds, um, and whereas in Newham, what a one bedroom flat costs £966. Um, uh, by Freedom of Information request from New, New Recorder, found that 27 new households were rehoused outside of London during 2012. But by last year, this figure had risen to 244 houses. 
Um, people are being moved as far as to Essex, as far away as Birmingham and as middle and Middlesbrough, which is 250 miles away, or four hour drive. All right, um, as you can see from these slides behind us, we're very active campaigners. So anything that we're here saying, and when we discuss social cleansing and the campaign, um, it's all came out of practical campaigning. Um, obviously, our, um, one of the main slogans of our campaign is social housing, not social cleansing. And that really came into fruition when we had one of our first protests um, at East Thames Housing Association. We took over the building and we had a party for the children and the show flat that they had for the Olympic um, state regeneration. And we went from that point and we marched down the road and we went to the local housing office. And it was there in the local housing office as we stood there amongst, I uh, don't know how many, 30, 40 people who were being moved out of London that day, who we were speaking to. That's when the fruition of talking about social cleansing and our campaign really came out. Um, and that's certainly the backbone of what we talk about. And what that's meant is that actually it's given us a bigger link with the wider community around the world because this is something that um, so many uh, cities and countries around the world are facing and we get contacted by a lot of people internationally who want to have a dialogue with us um, as they kind of see at least our campaign as one of the campaigns that's discussing this in terms of London. Um, so I wanted to say in our practical fight against our Labour Council, this is where this rhetoric has came from. I'm going to pass on to Jasmine now to say something. Hello, I'm Jasmine. I'm one of the mums who lived in Focus E15 and part of the Focus E15 campaign. First of all, I'd like to say thank you, Simon. I would have much more have preferred to hear from you than yeah. I down here. Um, so, I campaign um, when the, when the campaign first began we thought we're going to go to our labor mayor of course he's going to support us of course he's going to care we went to see him we we, we said hi what a focus e15 campaign his response was i know exactly who you are i think it's disgusting what you're doing if you can't afford to live in Newham, you can't afford to live in Newham. Uh, we went to see labor councillor terry paul who said you're not vulnerable, you're needy. So this is the response that we've had from the Labour Party. The Labour Party do not represent working class people. The Labour Party do not care about working class people. The Labour Party are socially cleansing working class people. So we, there's, there's no, there's, I'm really, I'm not happy that they're on the same platform. <laughs> Um, yeah, the Labour Party, they're, they're, they do not represent us at all whatsoever and we need to fight against them. Um, we have our street store every Saturday, 12 till 2 on Stratford Broadway outside Wilkinson's. But how dare you ask us to support the Labour Party? Where has the Labour Party been when we've had our school there for nearly three years? Where has the Labour Party been when people are being forced out of London, when people are crying, when people Supporting these people when they're in when they're in tears. Let's laugh at them. So I think it's disgusting that you said that we need to support the Labour Party because the Labour Party do not represent us at all. Should I add something to that? Do I, can you hear me? Is that alright? Yeah, right. So we went. So actually, um, a few, a couple of months ago, there was actually an inaugural meeting of the Newham, uh, Newham Against Austerity something or other, which was supposed to be the start of a new coalition challenging the austerity program uh, in, in, in Newham. And there was um, the MP, I can't remember it, Lynn Brown, and a couple of other people on the panel. And they all did their speeches, and then right at the end, uh, we did some questions. And I thought it was really interesting that there was maybe 50 people in the audience and nobody was talking about austerity. Everyone wanted to ask why the council had been treating them the way they have. No one is a, is a particularly vicious council in the way that it treats its residents. And it is part of the Labour Party, it's part of the same thing. So I'd be interested to know what you thought about how Robin Wales, you know, behaves. We asked councillors about what they think and they weren't prepared to talk to us about it. And they, nobody, nobody would talk about austerity, nobody would talk about cuts, people were talking about the way the council treat them, and I think that speaks volumes about actually the, the differences of what the council think, people think, and actually what people think and what they're experiencing.
And I will represent you with yourself. Fire. <laughs> I realise a lot of people want to ask a lot of questions, so... Um, okay, so, just want to put this in a bit of context. If you go back to 2009, there was actually a document which was released by the five host boroughs. It was converted. The idea of the Olympics was that what would happen over a period of 20 years was that the East London boroughs would converge to the same level of wealth, if you like, as the rest of London. And if you read those documents, it's quite amazing, really, because one of the aims of the convergence is actually says this, is homes for all. This is actually part of the claims that they were making at the time for the Olympics. Now, I've been doing a lot of work in East London for, for quite a few years now, looking particularly at housing issues, particularly at homelessness. And it's very, very clear to me that those sorts of incredibly grandiose promises were simply hot air. What's going on, you can see this right the way across, you know, particularly East London, but right the way across the city as a whole, is exactly this juxtaposition. On the one hand, then, you're seeing these new luxury flats going up, as Anna was talking about earlier on. And then on the other hand, you have this position whereby there's actually an increase in the number of people living in temporary accommodation, increase in the number of people living sleeping rough. So, the kind of like, there's this gap opening up very massively between housing, the set of exchange values, what you can buy and sell in the market, and homes as a use value. And, and this is what, this contradiction between these two elements is really what is coming to some sort of head in relationship to the city right now. The quote there is from Leroy, he very much exemplifies a young guy who was in a hostel not very far from here, who was actually there expressing what, you know, the kind of disappointments you had no expectations. A lot of people in East London did. But those expectations weren't realised. And in many ways, then, you could say that the Focus 15 campaign itself has emerged out of this sort of post Olympics landscape, this, this way in which then all these promises were made. Yet the reality for the mothers, for Jasmine and Sam, and all the other mothers at the Focus uh, at the hostel, was that these promises were, again, just simply not realised at all. So I'm going to do this. Talk and what I do in the paper is I'm trying to I'm trying to think through what's going on and what's going on in relationship to activism and space and the city and how the kind of transformation how these sort of transformations are going on. What I try to do is I try to look at it through certain theoretical lenses. Look at it through the work of Deleuze and Guattari. Deleuze and Guattari, then very famous uh, post-structuralists, wrote in the 70s and 80s. The first, book, the first volume of Catalyst of Schizophrenia was called anti Oedipus. It's essentially it's a demolition job on psychoanalysis. But the second volume then is The Thousand Plateaus. And this is probably the most frustrating book I think I've ever read in my entire life. But it's certainly one of the most enlightening. And the key to trying to understand what it is that they're talking about is it's a, it's a particular ontology. He's not thinking about reality so much in terms of fixity, essences, being. It's all predicated on notions of becoming, that things change. And I think if you look at, and I'll try and illustrate this, you can clearly see that there's been a whole set of becomings through the way the Fergus campaign has operated. And I illustrate some of these in the paper. Okay, they, and they, they, I'm not, again, I'm not going to, you know, can't do Deleuze and Guattari in two minutes, it's not possible. But essentially the idea is, one of the, one of the ideas is this, is that you make this distinction between smooth space and straight space. Straight space is essentially the space which the state creates. It's grids, it's lines, it's also the ways in which the state says, you can go here but you can't go there. You can ask these questions but you can't ask those questions. And Smooth space is space which cracks open those grids. It cracks it open. You can clearly see this through lots of the main occupations that we've seen recently. The Occupy movement in the US, Gezi Park in Turkey. 
what, they, what those occupation movements do, they create this smooth space. Spaces then in which kind of like social distinctions are eroded. And people then discover new ways to interact with each other. The other thing I try to look at in the paper is look at Hart and Negri's book, particularly Conwell. It's three key, key works. This was the last of the trilogy. And probably more traditional Marxist than certainly than Deleuze and Guattari, but one of their ideas is this idea about the metropolis. We talk about the city. And the city then, as they say, you know, if you think about the, the factory, the factory was then the site, the space of the industrial working class. Well, clearly, you know, in a, in a city like this, there isn't the same industrial working class. There simply isn't. That's not to say there aren't working classes, there are. But clearly it's far, it's far more diffuse. And their argument is that it's the city, the metropolis, which is the site of what they call the multitude. And one of the key aspects about the city, and this is really the, if you like, the emancipatory potential of the city, is that cities are spaces of encounters. They're spaces of encounters between difference. They're ways in which then people come, come together. People who from massively different walks of life, come together, meet, interact, and form something distinctively new. And the other thing that Hart and Negan pointed out is this about encounters. They say that political <coughs> encounters, you know, encounters which are sort of politically generative, they, 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 they make something happen, are also joyful encounters. And I think this is one of the things, and I've sat in you know, so my age, but I've sat in leftist meetings about housing, for very, very, very decades. And you know, I've got to say, if you go into those meetings, you feel slightly depressed, <laughs> you'll come out of those meetings suicidal. <laughs> they were not, joy, by and large, not joyful encounters. <laughs> and I think this is the thing, one of the things that, again, is to try and get across in the paper, and, and I think you can clearly see that from folks themselves, is that the spaces that they manage to create, the meetings that they have, the store that they run, these are joyful encounters. They're not the typical left miserableism. And I think that's really, really important. Okay, so the transformation. This is quite an amazing transformation in the space of a few months. As, well as, as, as Jasmine was saying, the mum's basically got the eviction notices from East End, in September 2013, this is them outside the hostel. The hostel's just, you know, literally 500 yards away. Less than a year later, the transformation occurred. The process of becoming occurred. In which then, the mothers have become Fergus E15. Not by themselves, there's a whole bunch of other people involved in this. But nevertheless, there's a new political dynamic involved. Yeah, uh, anyway, give me the paper if you want. <laughs> um, okay, so one of the points about the encounters is this, is that what originally happened was that the RCG, the British Communist Group, had got a stall, they got an anti-bedroom tax stall in Stratford. Basically then, um, you know, they'd been running this, and as one of them says, it's boring really, but nevertheless, it was there, performing a function, and then what happened is that one day, Four mums, four mothers then walk across, and there's this meeting. There's this encounter then on the streets, still ungentrified streets of Stratford. And that then was the sort of like, the, the, these are these chance, fantastic encounters that uh, you know, precipitated then this sort of this whole series of becomings. And in terms then, as, as they've already said, initially then the impact was through a series of occupations. And not, you know, kind of like uh, occupations for, for, for weeks or months, occupations for a few hours, but nevertheless, with an enormous transformative potential, both for the people involved, but also in relationship to the power, the power relationships that are involved between the mothers and between the agencies of the state. And it's very, very clear that there's shifts of power all the way along, that the campaign was gaining power. And talk about then the, the, uh, the occupation of the East Thames Housing Association, and we've already talked about this. But I'm just going to give you a quote from one of the Mars, because this is really, really a significant quote, I think. 
And this is this kind of, essentially the occupation was at this, this place here, these terms. And what they've done is they've rigged up a show flat. And the show flat then essentially showed what the new properties that they were building on the Olympic village, East Village were going to look like. But of course, the mums weren't going to get it. And when they occupied the flats, this was a real, real iron for the mothers. Because it's this juxtaposition between their own denuded space that they're actually living in, and then this kind of thing which was out of reach, they were never going to get. And, and that was a really, really, I think, important point in relationship to you know, why is it that we're being treated so appallingly when yet these new homes are supposedly being built and this legacy is supposedly for us? You already know, gained you know, a series of occupations, including then the Carpenters Estate. The Carpenters Estate is being regenerated, that word again, since 2005. And um, this is one of the most, I still, I still struggle to get my head around the contradiction. You have this half empty estate, which has been lying half empty for a decade, and yet the council which owns the estate has got thousands and thousands of people on its waiting list. It's got the largest number of people, 3,700 plus, in temporary accommodation in the city. People are being displaced from the city. <laughs> what kind of housing policy exactly is that? I'm still scratching my head trying to work that one out. And this is exactly the contradiction, the juxtaposition that the folks E15 campaign illustrates it through their occupation and through, again, the brilliant way that they've actually articulated these contradictions. These people need homes, these homes need people. And again, one of the ways then that the home, the flats, these, these were talked about, was that they were run down. And again, this was one of the key aspects, that when people went into their flats, they weren't run down at all. They were actually perfectly functioning. And this was a real shock, I think quite an eye opener for the people who went, went in at that time. And interestingly, after the campaign, oh, sorry, after, you know, through, through, towards, the, towards the end of the occupation of the state, the mayor of New York actually apologises, yeah. which is pretty much the equivalent of hell freezing over. <laughs> In terms of, again, thinking about space, essentially then what happened with that, what happened with the, 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 the opening up of the social centre? Again, it's smoothing a space. It's an amazing place to be for the two weeks it was occupied. People from all walks of life. Hundreds of people went through those, those particular occupied flats. What happened at the end then, this was taken on the very last day, where a few of us were there. But essentially then, they get boarded up. The space then is restriated, closed off. Interestingly though, as a result of the Apology, they did actually open the, the flats up and they did then house some homeless people in those flats. And again, you've got the weekly store, which uh, Fuck has already talked about. The problem is for me is if you want to think about a place to go in London, <laughs> you know, whereby Londoners from all walks of life meet, this is probably the best place to go, actually. You know, there you will find all kinds of people. It's not simply activists, or academics, or any, you know, whatever. There's a whole range of people there. And the interactions on the stall are quite amazing. And what the activists do in relationship to people who've got problems, cool. again, it's phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, but again, it's about a claim to a space. And this will come again from, from one of the campaigners. It's a really important spot, and at certain times that spot has been threatened with removal, as in the arresting of the table. 
Interestingly, thinking about the effects, this is the thing, is it's about, and those at the time I talk about packs, packs of worlds. I can explain if you want, but, and this is an interview that I did with um, people who've been, uh, yeah, essentially cleansed out of the borough of Newham, up into Welling Garden City. And they were talking about Focus E15, and they, did, they had interactions with the, with the campaign. And again, this was an empowering interaction. The people that are empowered that they can do something, they can actually challenge the various power structures that are there. And as Krista says, they come as a bunch. So, what you've got, and what's trying to argue in the paper, is a series of you know, movements, becomings, shifts from a fake show home to a temporary real home. For that kind of like moment, there's few hours the occupying of the East Thames Housing Association flats. It takes on the form of a real home. People can actually have fun and enjoyment and pleasure. Also, the shift then from this disused run-down block of flats to an open house. And from a boring and to austerity stall, there was, in my words, to a vibrant, joyful, weekly social housing, not social cleansing stall. At the end of the film, I make this parallel. It's a film, a Russian film, by uh, a couple of years ago. And the film is a perfect illustration of harvest accumulation by dispossession. It takes place in a remote, the edge of the world, northern Russia. The central character, Nikolai, he owns the house there. And what's happening is that there's going to be a public-private partnership with the mayor. The mayor has got then some money, and he's going to knock his house down. And what happens is that the film is really about Nikolai's struggle to try and sort of like to prevent this from happening. And he does in many ways what Ferguson 15 have done. He's kind of like, he's, 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 he's gone into spaces that he shouldn't go to. He asks questions that he shouldn't ask. In his case, I'm not going to give you a spoiler for what happens, but um, things could be better, let's put it that way. <laughs> But the parallel with focus is this, and obviously you can think about it in terms of conversion by dispossession, mayors, you can think about it in terms of public private partnerships, all these kind of things. But the key thing is this for me. There's a key difference. And the difference precisely is to do with the city. And it's to do with the fact that the city then is a space in which you can have these alternative comings together. Nikolai, He's terribly isolated in many ways. In many ways, he's actually isolated in his own household. So that power of coming together as a pack is very important. So, as far as I'm concerned, the Fantasy 15 campaigners then are a pack of inspirational nomads who don't know their place. They should be always kept out, but they don't. They go to places they're not supposed to go. And that, to me, I think is a fundamentally important political act. Because too often, I think, activists, you know, essentially, you know, it's like if you think, okay, well, as long as I can, like, sit at the table with the powers that be and be nice and polite, etc., etc., then there'll give me some crumbs off the table. Well, you know, I'm kind of thinking that's kind of not happening to enough, really. And just the point about the end, and this is really this thing about, you know, about activism. What is activism? Well, I don't think activism, I'm not a great activist, I'll appreciate that. I'm not, I don't know if I'm a good academic, but I'm certainly not a great activist, I'm a gay. But what is activism? And some people think of activism as a set of recipes. You know, there's these sort of things that you have to do. You can roll out these things because we did those before. Well, I actually think in some ways, activism, that's obviously that's part of it. But also activism, it's an art. It's partly an art. It's partly about being creative. It's partly about being imaginative. It's not about simply following some set of recipes. It's about doing things differently. And I think that's really, really, and again, about imagining, imagining alternative worlds. We'll just finish off. Yeah, I think, Paul, we need to let people talk. OK, yeah. sorry. Yes, seriously. Right, just one, two. Seriously. <laughs> the play, one of the plays about the Infocity 15 was uh, Land of Three Towers, which was written by Eva Mary Morris, who's one of the, one of the uh, campaigners. And the great thing about that play was that what it showed 
was that the mums were making up as they went along. It was a creative set of processes. 